Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about extraordinary experiences of everyday people. And today, our guest is Rachel Dempster. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited about this interview. Um, we'll just get right into it. If you wouldn't mind, could you um, just share a little bit about yourself, a little background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm originally from Southern Indiana, close to Kentucky. Um, I lived in Indiana my pretty much my entire childhood and early adult life until I was like in my early 20s. And then um, I went to a private art school out in Colorado, and I reside here now for about a decade now, almost 11 years. It's beautiful out here. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so if I may ask, because we're going to get into a very interesting um, near-death experience in, in a second, but I'm very curious, did you grow up religious or um, like a spiritual background at all? So um, my dad was really religious growing up and he would get us dressed and we'd go to church every Sunday. And I was pretty young at that time, like I was in elementary school. So I didn't fully understand the concept of what religion was. So for me, it was like, I would get up, I would go have donuts <laughs> and then we would go to lunch afterwards. So yeah. that aspect of religion growing up didn't really connect with me too terribly much but by the time I was in high school my mom was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer she's still alive um mm -hmm. but we she kind of went through this like this like uh, religious movement for herself mm -hmm. she the a lot of her friends that had previously gone to church she didn't feel as connected with them she didn't have a lot of community support when she was going through her treatments and things of that nature and um she kind of learned that she's a little bit more spiritual that she felt more connected to people versus than what she was connected to from like a preacher or like a a, a bible or some form of religious literature telling her how to live her life mm. she kind of had she went through treatment for a long time and so for herself she had to she had a lot of time for self-reflection and mm -hmm. she kind of came to the conclusion that she's just more spiritual. So by the time that I was becoming more interested in religion, I was about, I was in high school, uh, we kind of did the spiritual journey together. So we would go to different like uh, psychic fairs and different events. And we would go together and just kind of like really get to experience a lot of different things on our own comfort, our own pace. And so for me, that's where I learned personally that Christianity may not be the perfect religion for me and that's okay, but I can be, I can find my own religion, whether that's with a specific sect or a religion on its own, or I can just be content with my own self. And so for myself now, I am what I consider like a, a pantheist. So I think that I am equal with nature and animals. I'm no greater than any living organism on this planet. And we're all interconnected and interwoven into this beautiful cosmos that just creates this harmonious living experience and that's the way I try to live my life every day is that I value animals and the planet and the, the greenery around me so that I can preserve my life and other people's around me mm, nice um now just curious because you brought up the psychic <laughs> cares <laughs> are you or your mom do you have any clairvoyance or clairabilities so yes uh okay we, we kind of talked about it. i have a TikTok page a lot of people found my near-death experience on there when i was growing up i lived in a house and it had a lot of energy in it and we actually moved out of the home because it became so frightening for all of us to live there that we finally moved out oh. um it was very haunted it was very um and it, it wasn't a lot of nice spirits that were there hmm. um they pretty much tormented my brother and I when we were growing up when I was in junior high my mom finally just could not deal with it anymore we left our childhood home she was like I can't deal with this anymore mm -hmm. and the house does not have continuous occupants in it till this day so oh um, my gosh it, it's really weird it's like it's really a weird situation but mm -hmm. um my mom's mom had 
uh, clairvoyant tendencies. She could always just sense when something was wrong with me. And she always knew like when I was upset or she just, she just knew things that she shouldn't know. Cause I wouldn't tell her, but she just, she had a way with connecting with us. And I honestly believe that it was because she was just very sensitive to people, almost empathic, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, um, my psychic intuitions or being able to see shadow people and people that have passed didn't actually click with me until after my near death experience. Hmm. Um, curious. Yes. I wonder if it kicked it in a little bit and like it did. maybe it was uh, dormant and then kind of <laughs> kicked it into it, gear. I always had like, I'm, I, when I was growing up, I was empathic. Um, I thought it was just because of like, <clears throat> my, like I would have to read people like, um, my dad and I didn't have the best relationship when I was growing up. And I always had to kind of gauge his emotions right when he walked in the door to figure out if I needed to be calm and quiet and maybe not get on his bad side right when he came home or if I could be bubbly and happy and like, Oh, look what I did at school. You know what I mean? Hmm. So I think to a degree I had empathic abilities, like what my grandmother had, but after I had my near death experience, um, it definitely went into full swing. Um, it was, it was really unique. So we'll touch (laughs) <laughs> in a minute, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind, I would love for you to kind of um, walk us through leading up to your near-death experience and then take us through that. Absolutely. So okay. I'm a huge advocate for mental health because my mental health was really poor when I had my near-death experience. Um, I was really kind of, dep- I was really depressed, to be, uh, not kind of, I was severely depressed when I was in college, um, I just kind of went through this spell, like where I wasn't happy. I was in this toxic relationship with a guy that I had met in college and I wasn't being true to myself. I knew deep down that I wasn't in, I wasn't straight, but I was so fearful because when I was in college, that was like 2009, 2010 is when I started college. Mm -hmm. And that was really like, it was still so not okay to be out and about. And we had a very small like pride group on campus, but they were really ostracized. Like they weren't allowed to do different events um, and things of that nature. It had to get approved. And it was this, it was a big stepping stone for the group to even just be able to assemble on campus. So I felt there were a lot of people that were LGBTQ, but I mean, that was still very much in the closet. So for myself, I was really struggling with my sexuality. I was in a toxic relationship and um, I had a doctor that prescribed me a very large dose of Xanax because I was having a lot of anxiety and depression. And um, I was with this guy and he just, it wasn't a good relationship and he was really verbally abusive and he kind of triggered me from a um, an issue that I had when I was in high school. And I just, I think I just mentally snapped a little bit. I was like, man, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So I'm not going to. And I took my entire prescription of Xanax. Um, It was a 90 day supply and I took the whole thing and I, yes, yes. It was a lot. Um, It was a lot. I turned on my laptop and I put on Netflix and that's when you had to order DVDs from Netflix. That's how old I am. Netflix oh. wasn't right. <laughs> so Netflix, huh. right. Netflix wasn't where you could just click it and it turned on your account. Like you could order DVDs to be sent to you. Yeah. So I had some DVDs that were sent to my dorm room and I turned them on and that was the last thing that I remember. And then I blacked out. Hmm. So, um, I kind of have moments of consciousness where I'm kind of coming in and out. And the last thing that I auditively remember someone saying to me was, if you don't stop fighting me, which I found out later, this was the EMT that was coming into my dorm. They had put me on a stretcher and they were taking me away to the, to the emergency room. Okay. Um, the EMT said, well, you're really not going to like me if I have to shove this tube down your throat. So you need to drink this. And I found out later that they were trying to get me to drink a charcoal beverage to absorb the toxins that were in my body. And then I'm completely black out. I don't hear anything anymore. And then it seems like almost instantaneously that I'm like floating down 
from this this like plane that I'm leaving and entering a different existence. And there is this tree. I'm standing at the grass and everything is like insanely bright. Like I've never seen colors like it in this realm is a is a kind of funny way to say it but i have never seen colors as beautiful or vibrant that i have while i was there hmm. so i'm standing at this on the grass and there's like this pond of water in front of me almost but it's not a pond it's i can't explain it it was just a body of water is the nice way to put it huh, okay and i'm standing there and i'm looking up towards the towards the sky and there is this massive tree and it sounds cliche but the only way that i can explain the size parameters of this tree is from the movie avatar so like how small the people were in avatar compared to that tree is exactly like what it was like it was the biggest anything any living plant that i've ever seen and it was really gorgeous it was massive um I always like to kind of explain how this, this place was, I call it the tree. <laughs> um, so when you're standing on the edge of the ocean and you're standing like on the beach and you can look out and you see like the curvature of the earth kind of in the color of the sky. So it does that gradient effect and you kind of get a sense like, oh, we're encapsulated in a globe essentially. When I was at this place, there was no sense of horizon. There was no sense of horizon. There was no sense of space. It was endless. And when I was there looking at the tree, I remember I could look up past the tree a little bit because of how big it was. And there was no differentiation in the color of the sky. So like when you look at a skyline, it goes from light to dark. There was none of that. It was all the same color of blue. And it was really unique. And it was a... Uh, I've never seen that color blue again, and I can't explain it, but it's like the prettiest blue you'll ever see. When it's your time and it's appropriate, it's the prettiest colors you'll ever see. It's gorgeous. Um, I remember when I got there, I didn't feel any emotion. I wasn't sad, I wasn't cold, I wasn't hot, I wasn't hungry or sad or happy. I was just kind of like, almost like taking in my surroundings a little bit. And this voice that sounded like, a million voices at once sounded like nothing I had ever heard of, but everything I had always heard. So it's kind of, it sounds super cliche, but that's the best way I could explain it. Um, I remember uh, the voice, it voices, voice said to me, ask the questions you wish to seek the knowledge for. And in my head, I instantly knew that this was, everything was okay. Like I got this sense of like, oh, this is, this is okay. Like nothing's wrong. I didn't have this impeding sense of like, oh my God, I'm dying. So like when people ask me, did you know you were dying? No, I did not know I was dying because I had no pain. I had no emotion. I wasn't, the only thing I could hear was the voice. I didn't hear any animals around me or anything of that nature. It was just kind of like hmm. really serene, peaceful feeling. Um, so I asked the question like in my head almost like what does it mean to be a good person because that was something that I had been struggling with because I had heard in church my whole life like if you're you're gay or you're part of the LGBTQ spectrum you're instantly going to hell because you're a sinner and I thought to myself well I'm nice to people like I treat people the way that I would want to be treated, but just because I love someone who is the same sex means that I'm instantly a sinner. That doesn't make sense to me. I'm following the rest of the rules, but just this one <laughs> rule is send me somewhere I don't want to go. Uh, so I remember I asked the question, what does it mean to be a good person? And I was, it, it instantly came to my mind. Like it was, I hate to be so cliche, but it was almost telepathic. Like instantly I was fed this information. I comprehended. It, there was no need to like go into depth about what each step meant. Um, what was weird was I got to see experiences and conversations that I had had with other people where I wasn't very nice. So um, I remember I was having, I was in my body having the conversation with the person that I hadn't been nice to. 
But then in the next second, I was in her body and I got to experience how that conversation made her feel. And then how in turn she continued that negativity towards other people. And it was a ripple effect. And I instantly knew like, oh my God, how I treat other people doesn't stop with me and her. It continues. So when I see all these videos of like Karen's freaking out and this and that, it's like so toxic because it's like, yeah, it's like this social, social pariah right now. But what we don't understand is that it's a ripple effect. It doesn't just stop with her and the person that she's having the altercation with. That person that has had the altercation takes it home and they bring it to other people. And it's just this ripple effect of negativity that happens. And I remember I was instantly like jolted back to the tree after experiencing that lesson that I needed to learn on why just because I'm in a bad mood doesn't mean that I need to project that onto other people because it doesn't just stop with me. That being a good person means that you treat everyone with respect, regardless if you think they deserve it or not. Uh, and I instantly understood it. Like there wasn't like, oh, I need to like, what, what did you mean by that? It was instantaneous. Um, and I remember kind of being like jarred, like that was really intense because I got to experience that conversation through myself, her, and the other people that she had continued that ripple effect of negativity with. So that was kind of interesting. And then of course we always have to be curiosity kills the cat. Uh, the next question that I asked was, well, what, what happens if you're a bad person? And instantly I was enveloped from head to toe, like in a black shadow, like there was no light, there was no depth. It was just black. And I remember I looked around and these people kind of were around me, but not next to me. So like, I was like in this vicinity with all these other people and we're nude. We have no clothing. You can see each other, but you can't like interact with each other. So like right now you and I are having a conversation, like we can see each other. And I understand that you and I are having this conversation but when I was in the pit, um, I could see people, but it's like, they couldn't, they, we could see each other, but it's like, we could not communicate whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And we were all nude and we're all kind of like, you can hear things there. Like, whereas in with the tree, it was really peaceful and calm and all oh, this is fantastic. This felt like being in a subway or like a mosh pit type area, but it wasn't any fun. And it was all shades of gray, like grays and whites. And I remember I'm nude and I'm hearing people like screaming for their mom or they're calling out loved ones names. And I remember being like, oh my God, this is absolutely insane. Like, I don't, what is this? This is crazy. And if anyone's ever been depressed, like severely depressed where you're like really struggling mentally, that is what the pit feels like. It feels like the deepest part of your depression where you don't feel anything. You're just kind of there. Mm. Um, and I remember looking around and this little boy was there, which I don't understand why he would be there, but he was there. And I remember looking down at him and he was a little bitty kid. He was like probably like four or five years old, maybe six. And I remember looking down at him in his eyes. I could just see the whites. There was no color in his irises or his pupils. It was all black. And he went to open his mouth to like cry and no sound came out. And I was like, that really, like, it didn't scare me so much, but it was like really intense. Like it was a really intense, like, if I think about it too much, it kind of makes me upset. Like it gives me like goosebumps and stuff, but it was one of those moments where I don't, I, it really kind of made me realize like, I need to change what I'm doing. Cause the way I feel about myself and the way I'm communicating with other people isn't going to get me where I want to not, I don't want to say get me where I want to be in the long run, but I don't want to have to relearn these lessons over and over again. I want to learn them right the first time. So I don't have to keep having this, this life lesson replay itself over and over again. And so, um, then I, it's like, I just kind of woke up. I woke up back in my body on earth as, as cliche as that sounds. That's the only way I can explain it. And my mom was in the uh, hospital with me and I woke up and I don't, 
I, I think the first thing I asked my mom was, who are those people behind you? My dad and my brother are here. And she like gave me this weird look. She was like super concerned. She was really upset, mm-hmm. but she said, uh, no one's here. It's just me. And I was like, no, no, no. Like there are people behind you. They're in the doorway. And she turned around and she's like, she, then she really got upset. She kind of teared up and got emotional. And she was, I'm Rachel. I'm not kidding. There's no one with you. You need to stop. It's just me and you. Um, and to this day, I can still remember seeing the shadow people in the door, like standing there, Hmm. looking at me at, in the door. And, um, I really think that was like my moment where I realized that I had gained abilities, but I was still really out of it. And I, cause I'm still, I mean, I'm coming off of a 90 day Xanax, (laughs) a Xanax bender. I hate to say that it was very true. So Um, I was really out of it for a long time. Um, And then the next thing I asked my mom was, how old am I? I was like, you still, you look really good. Like, how old am I? It is like, you're, I can't remember how old I was. I think I was like, maybe like 20, 21. She was like, you're this old. And I was like, no, there's no way that can't be right. I'm much older than that. Mm. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I was gone for a long time. Like I was gone for a long time. And I just remember I, that's like the one thing I remember I kept telling her like that I was gone for a long time. And she was like, she was really confused about it. Cause I'm not making sense. I'm sure she's concerned that I like fried my brain to the point where there's no coming back. Oh. And it, sh- she didn't ask a lot of questions at the time. Cause I wasn't making sense. Um, but she took me home and um, I guess that's, where my roommate at the time called my mom and said, Hey, she's not well, you need to get her to a facility. Uh, because she, she, she's not playing around just like doing recreational drugs or anything. Like she's, she's really sick. She's trying to, to, to end her life. So my mom and my dad made the decision to send me to a mental health facility for like two months. And that was the best thing they could have done for me for two things. One, I got help that I needed and I learned that it's okay to be gay. (laughs) And then two, I met this amazing therapist. I won't say her name just for confidentiality. Like I don't want to like get her in a stink for me sharing my uh, therapy plan that we had, but she was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I remember we were kind of having a conversation like you and I are now, and she, I was kind of like skirting around this, the fact that I had died and I had seen like the afterlife. Cause I didn't want to be in there for too long. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I want, I wanted to get out of there. So, um, I remember, um, I had a lady, um, I'm going to call her Louise. I had a lady that was in my, my, my room with me and she was an elderly lady. And she had tried to hurt herself because her last friend had passed away. So her, yes, it was very sad. She was probably like in her eighties and her kids had put her in there for her own safety until they could get things figured out to where she could go home with one of them. Mm. Um, And I remember I was in my room with Louise and um, I remember I was sleeping in my bed and she was on the other side of the, of the room with me. Mm-hmm. And there was a man standing at the edge of her bed. And I thought it was a nurse. I thought she had passed away because she was very old. I was like, oh my God, this lady died in my room. What the heck? And I remember being like, I looked over at the end of the bed and there's this man standing there. And I said, is everything okay? And he really slowly turned his head towards me and didn't say anything. He just stood there. And I was like thinking to myself, I need to hit the call button because someone has gotten out and they're in my room. Like that's wild. What the heck? And I went to go reach across to get the button and I turned around and he was gone. And I instantly was like, oh my God, what is happening? And I remember instantly crying, thinking, oh my God, I have really screwed my brain up. Like I have really screwed my brain up to the point where I'm hallucinating and seeing things now. And this is like, this is just my life now. Like this is how it is. Uh. and then the next day I didn't sleep after that I was too freaked out to fall asleep because I'm thinking oh my god what if I like open my eyes and he's in front of my bed like that'll be freaking weird no way um and I remember 
the next day I had a session with my therapist that was at the cl- the service for me. And um, I looked, she goes, well, you, you're improving. I'm really happy with how things are going right now. Like, is there anything that you want to tell me? Like, this is a free space. You can really openly share. She was fantastic. And I remember just getting like really anxious and I started tearing up and I was like, I'm scared that you're going to think I'm crazy. And she kind of like made a joke. She's like, well, it can't get any worse than it already is. Am I right? I was like, that's true. (laughs) You're not wrong. Um, And so I went through and told her everything. I went through and told her about the tree and the pit and seeing the shadow people and seeing the man at the end of Louise's bed. And she instantly stopped me. She was like, okay, we're going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to get a pen and some paper and I have a recorder in my desk. If it's okay with you, I want to go through and have you really divulge this conversation with me again. And I want every detail. I was like, okay. So she goes and grabs everything. She opens up a filing cabinet. That's like about my height and I'm five, nine. So it was really tall. She opens up one of the middle drawers, pulls out a, a vanilla, a vanilla envelope, lays it down. She turns on the recorder and she's like, I have consent from at the time, my maiden name, um, from Rachel. We're going to go over this in detail. Rachel, will you just give me consent auditory that you are fine with me having this conversation with you? So I go through the whole spiel. We go through everything. It takes like probably an hour and a half to two hours. She wanted to know extremely specific things, kind of like how our conversation is, but a little bit more in depth. And when she turned everything off, she closed it and she said, I'm going to be really honest with you. Um, You've had what we call a near-death experience. And people that have near-death experiences, sometimes after they pass on and come back, they can see people that have passed on that are stuck here, or they're seeing things that they can't explain. And this is normal. This is really normal. And it kind of like gave me this like really huge sense of relief. Like, oh my God, this is crazy. Yeah. She then turns to me and says, the filing cabinet behind me? I was like, yeah. She's like, this is all files of near-death experiences that I have talked to people with. This is what I, yes. So she's like, you're one of my cases now. And put it in there. And she's like, and they're all very similar. Like you have extremely similar points that my other near-death experiences have had. And it was really for me, that gave me a lot of comfort knowing that I'm not, I haven't messed my brain up to the point where I'm hallucinating, that I'm not the only one going through this, that there, there's a whole cabinet behind me full of people that have had the same thing as me. And um, it gave me a little bit of solace because she brought, she asked if I would be comfortable having my mom and dad come in to talk about it because she thinks that if she knew that if I had that conversation with them, without her there that they would really think I was sick and I invited my mom in I was like I don't think my dad's ready for that like (laughs) he's not ready for that just yet but my mom my mom will be so she brought my mom in and she educated my mom and my mom was like okay like what do we do so the therapist that I have she gave me a lot of really great resources and I continued to see her for about a year afterwards and we just kind of really talked about everything while I was going through school and um it was it was really helpful so and now I'm 11 12 almost 12 yeah like almost 12 years like sober from having to take any type of anxiety medication and I've been I haven't had a serious bout of depression like what I did when I was in college since and I'm almost 32 now so it's great Yes, that is wonderful. At how long ago then was, how many years ago was the ND? So I, what I, it was like my second, you you- second year of college, I think. So it so like- was like 2010, 2011. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and you've, you mentioned you're married as well and you've yes. been married for several years as well. Uh, so my, my wife and I have been together for almost 10 years, 10 years. And- okay. Yes. And we met when I was, I had been two years out of my near death experience, maybe okay. three or three years out. And I met her while I was going to school out here in Colorado. So, um, 
we've been married for five uh, four or five years this October. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like life just kept improving for you. You know, it, um, it really did. After my near-death experience, um, I had to stay, so I had to stay uh, in contact with my therapist for a year before I could be cleared to um, kind of continue a daily life. So like if I missed an appointment for two weeks, they would do a wellness check on me, mm -hmm. which I know my mom was like, you're not missing any. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I didn't miss any. Um, after I was cleared from my, uh, therapy sessions and my mental health screenings and everything like that, um, I decided that Indiana just, it was a lot of negative things had happened there for me in like high school, like, both my parents had cancer. I, I struggled with sexual assault in high school from, from, from two male friends in high school. So I yeah. just was, it was a lot. I had a lot happen in a very short time in high school. And then when I do have that in-depth conversation with people about what kind of led up to the near-death experience, they go, oh, I, well, now I can see why you would be depressed. Uh, so yeah. a lot yeah, a lot of different things happen. A lot. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, that, that's lot. just, that's just, I am so glad you made it through and are using your platform to help others who could be yes. going through the same kinds of things, you know? Yes. Um, is it okay if I ask you a few questions about no. NDE? Yes, of course, please. Absolutely. Whatever you got to do. Well, so I'm I'm really curious on your interpretation of the pit. Was that hell? Um, was that real? Was that something you and your higher self created for your lessons for when you come came back? I mean, what are you feeling now after all these years? What is really resonating with you about what that is or was? So I think that when you have a near-death experience that it is like I think it's a cosmetic or cosmos teaching you a lesson if that makes sense so like every I believe every single human being regardless of how long they're here on this planet has a lesson that they need to learn and that could be um a baby being born for an hour and a half not ever having love and then that parent loves them and they pass away knowing that they were loved. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those types of things happen and this, these lessons, these near-death experiences or things of that nature, they teach you what you aren't able to learn in the, in the moment that you're living. So me being a closeted homosexual in a super conservative part of the United States and really struggling with processing trauma that had happened to me mm -hmm. for a good majority of my life. I think that the near-death experience was teaching me just because bad things happen to you doesn't mean that you have to perpetuate that ripple effect of negativity. It can stop with you. It can start with you and it can stop with you. And um, I think the pit was my depression like that was my lesson that I needed to learn was that huh. you can let the negative consume you and then you can be a shell of a person walking oh. around with all these other shell of people or oh. you can choose to get help and you can choose to try to be better um now that was just my lesson it's not I'm not promoting it for anyone else so if if someone uh -huh. is struggling depression or thoughts of suicide you know help is is crucial but this is just just my personal take on it but for me the pit was very real the pit was very real like um how many years did that you feel like that lasted that section oh my gosh okay so that's the crazy thing is like when I came out of my near-death experience I as cliche as it sounds I literally felt like I was a hundred years old oh. uh, my my oh. soul feels very old like even oh. still this day like things that used to get me riled up when I was younger like they don't bother me as much anymore and I I actually at my new job that I just started working at here not too long ago um 
I had a coworker look at me and she's like, you're so mature for your age. Like if I was as mature as you at 30, I think my life would be totally different by now. And I'm thinking in my head, like, well, the maturity level that I had to reach wasn't from the best type of mannerisms. So, uh, take it for what you will. I feel like, um, I feel like for myself, I was so wrapped up in, I don't want to say being a victim, but I was so wrapped up in my own negativity about my parents being sick and what had happened to me in high school that the pit was just like this manifestation of how I viewed myself, if that mm, makes sense. Um, absolutely. Uh, it does make sense. I, I have had another interview with an ND ear who went to a hellish place and she felt the same way that it was sort of a manifestation of all the things that she had not dealt with that yes. she was she was going to deal with right there and then yeah, uh, it's, kind of a hard lesson right now it's not you're not going to get a second chance and you know like the, after that after that experience from what i had the trauma from just different things with childhood and you know my parents and everything else it doesn't I'm not like, it. it's not so painful to touch that wound any further. It's kind of like healed on its own in a sense, almost. But I think that the wound was really opened very broadly to mm -hmm. let it and seep out before it could be finally closed and healed fully. So that makes sense. So now do you have any theories as to when we don't have a near-death experience, when we cross over, like when we die our physical body dies and that's it we don't come back do you think um if you have stuff to deal with you will you might experience a hellish first portion of your afterlife experience or do you not have any theories on that so the only theory that i think that i would have is i believe in i believe in like reincarnation because there are things that i have experienced that I'm like, oh, wow, I've, I've been here before, like a deja vu moment. But for myself, I really believe that when, when it's our turn to go, we're all going to learn lessons. Not, I don't think everyone is going to go to a pit or right. I don't think everyone is going to experience the tree in the same mannerisms that I did. But for me and my personal experience, there were things that I really, it wasn't my time, obviously, because I'm still here, but there were things that I needed to experience and there were things that I needed to do as an intellectual to, to better myself so that I could stop the cycle of trauma and stop the cycle of negativity. And I think for myself that that was my personal lesson for what everyone else experiences. Um, my grandfather, not to go off tangent, my grandfather lost three children in his life and he had a daughter named Erica and she had childhood leukemia and this is before St. Jude was even created she died a year or two before St. Jude was even founded and um he told me once um when it was just me and him having conversations about life I asked him about Erica I was like um what was she like and he's he was telling me about her and he said you know um when she passed away, when she was dying from cancer, I was holding her and it was nighttime and you, you, your grandmother and I were in the room with her while she was actively passing away. And she looked out the window and she said, oh, daddy, look at the light. Look at, you can hear the birds singing. And she passed away. So I think that we all experience things at a level of when we're ready. So like, obviously a child isn't going to experience the same tree that I did, but I think in a certain sense, like everyone experiences death in their own way, but there may not be the, there may not be a cookie cutter mold of it. It's, mm -hmm. I think, I think it is strictly based on your own personal preferences and the messages that you are willing to accept and what you need to learn. Mm. Interesting. Okay. And the the heavenly portion of your experience and you mentioned the voices mm -hmm. um i what were what were the voices what do you think or the voice the voices you said they were just all kinds of voices speaking it's, to you like when you go to a concert and you're and you're in the moment and everyone's singing 
that's what it was like. It was millions of voices all in one. Wow. Sharing this information with you. And it wasn't overwhelming. So I think people, when they think of like a concert, it's loud, but this was very calming. It was very soothing. It wasn't like Hmm. where you would like shudder from the voices talking to you. It was almost like it enveloped you when it spoke. Um, For me, I think I really believe that the voices or the voice that I heard was, I really believe it was a higher power telling me like, you got to shape up girl, (laughs) what, how, how you're treating yourself and how you're living your life right now isn't suiting you. And I'm going to make sure that you change. Mm. And for whatever reason, um, the lesson that I got was that what I was doing wasn't working for me and that I needed to make some pretty serious changes. And, um, I, I'm really glad that I, I took the lessons that I was given and really gave myself the reflection to do what I needed to do. Cause I really believe that if I hadn't taken what had happened to heart and I was just like, yeah, whatever, forget about it. I really think I would have died. I think if I had continued on the path that I was on with the depression and the self-loathing and the negativity, I really think that I would have passed away or I would have become a serious drug addict. Um, and my life would have been horrendous. So yes, I really believe that. So, um, I'm glad that I, I changed. Oh gosh. Yeah. And it's, it's just amazing. Um, the person that you've become, um, so I'm so happy for you and for us. Um, I have another question yeah. for, for you, or it's not really a question. It's more of a comment. I love that you got, it sounded like you got these downloads of information. And when you said it was like, I just knew I didn't have to do follow-up questions. Like in no. this life, we're so limited. And I can't tell you how many times it's like you, you want to communicate with someone and back and forth and you struggle and you wish or I have wished to like, just download the information. <laughs> and they are just like, oh, okay, I got it. Yes. Um, I, I hope that's the way it is when I cross over with everyone. You know, I mean, it's almost like we all have these aha moments in our life. Like, oh my gosh, uh, I figured out, like when you're a kid, I figured out how to tie my shoes. They become second nature. I have never had a moment in my life and I still have it that has been equivocal to the information that I received when I had, when I had my near death experience, Mm -hmm. it was literally like, it was just, it was like telepathically implanted. There was no, there was no way that I could have not understood it. You know what I mean? Like it was just, it was in there. And I think for myself, like it was so amazing to physically be granted the knowledge instantaneously but then I also got to do the visual aspect of myself communicating and then being put into the other person's body so like it was so unique so like this conversation that you and I are having I would be in my eyes seeing my hand motions and everything and then the next second I'd be seeing through myself through your eyes and how I'm communicating to you and how my mannerisms and my tone of voice is affecting you and your emotions I, yes. That's totally sounds like a, one of the um, life reviews that I've heard before. And, yes. and I've heard them e- explained in different ways, but it's kind of the same thing that they're doing. They, yeah. the, those who are waiting for us on the other side. <laughs> the all higher power. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What is your spirituality now? Like what, what's your, what are your thoughts on? Well, you said you believe in reincarnation. Do you believe in like a, a higher power then? So um, this is what got me in trouble with the last interview that I did. So I'll try to word it a little bit more carefully. <laughs> okay. So, um, what we are taught by other humans in a, in a sanctioned religion versus what you experience when you pass on are two totally different things. So this, like the, the my personal Christianity, all fearing God versus what I saw and what I experienced or my higher power are two totally different things. And I think with, with religion that is taught by humans. So if I were to go up to a church and teach and read from scripture, I'm going to put personal emphasis on different passages 
and messages that I personally believe in and want them to be spread versus what is really important. And so for myself, I really think that religion is wonderful. And if you need that to be a part of your staple, to hold yourself accountable, to be a great person, then yes, do that. Absolutely. Like if you need something or someone to, that you feel like you need to be held accountable to, then by all means do it. But I think to a certain extent, how humans interpretate religion and how they can communicate it to other people versus how it can be skewed. It's not the same. So for myself, um, I am very spiritual. I believe that animals and people and plants are all in the same playing field. We're all equal. I am no greater than a bug outside because I, I'm going to die. I'm going to go into this earth one day and the, my, my, grave site or wherever however I choose to go will be there but the soul goes into the same cosmos of which it came from Mm. so we're all in this really beautiful intricate system together and I think humans have this grandiose version of themselves that we are more important than anything else and our livelihood is more important than anything else but there is a lot of that we just can't see because we're so jaded towards ourselves Hmm. and if we take down those blinders and just realize like, I'm going to die one day, regardless of how much money I have, what kind of car I have, what kind of house I live in, like that all doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but how I can change myself and interpretate with other people and then therefore create ultimately a better place for people that's going to be happier and healthier and more loving. That's what life really all about is just right. being a loving person to everyone and everything um i'm assuming you do you, do you not have fear of death any longer i don't know if no. you did before but you, yeah you're like no <laughs> you know like <laughs> it's so i mean this is going to sound really macabre and i hope it doesn't come off weird uh my grandparents had five children and they lost three in their lifetime and they <sighs> very right it was very sad they very openly talked about death a lot Hmm. and they very openly spoke about how they couldn't wait to see their other children again and so for me I always knew that death was never the end it was the beginning of something much greater and so for myself I didn't really fear death so much growing up and then when I had my dear near-death experience obviously I didn't know I was dying because I was somewhere way cooler. And then when I came back, I was almost kind of like, I don't know sometimes if people feel like they're angry about being back on earth, but there was a while where I was like, man, I just wish that I was back there because it was so peaceful and so beautiful, but you can't, I decided that I just couldn't fixate on that. Like, yeah, death is the ultimate, but there was a lot of things I needed to hear first before I transcend into the other portion of my life. But uh, no, I don't fear death. I I didn't fear death to begin with, but afterwards I am not scared of death. And it is an inevitable fact that everyone's going to die at some point in their life. We all have this, we all have two experiences that we can all guarantee have. We all are born and we all die. That's all we have. That's the only thing that connects us together. Um, I have so enjoyed this conversation. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. Um, yeah. Before we say goodbye, um, I do want to know, are you, are you working on any projects? Current yeah. projects going on? Yeah. So um, my wife and I just bought a house in this crazy Colorado market. So <laughs> I'm in my cool. studio. Yeah. Um, oh. I am actually working on some pet portraits uh, for people. Um, I feel like one of the ways that I can help people process death a little bit better is by painting portraits of their pets or past loved ones that have gone on. So, um, I try to capture their likeliness and, and make it a little bit easier for them to remember the best parts of that person's life that may have been here or passed away. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. So how do we see this work and how do we contact you yeah um so you can go to my instagram page uh d designs or you can find me on tiktok 
uh, that's probably where I post the most ridiculous nonsense. Uh, and that's uh, Ray Ray Dem, R-A-Y-R-A-Y-D-E-M-P. And my near-death experience is on there. And um, I answer a lot of different questions from different people too. Oh, cool. Okay. And I will put those links in the video description. Awesome. Um, I'm curious, do you think you'll ever write a book about this? Yeah. Okay. So you're like the fourth person to be like, you should write a book. <laughs> I mean, um, if you, if you want, it would make I, a good I, book. <laughs> I think so. at some point in my life, I really would write a book, but I would want to be able to make the book a little bit more about like a visual. Cause I'm an artist. So like a lot of my, a lot of the way that I speak is with visuals. So I would love to be able to like illustrate and find a way to make things like visual for people so they can understand wh what I that'd went through. That'd be great. I think that'd yeah. be great. But I think we kind of talked about this before we started recording that the colors that yeah. you pass on, there is, there is no man-made color that you can do to, mm -hmm. to even hit a scope of what it looks like up mm -hmm. there or wherever we go. So for me, it's kind of like, oh, I would love to do that, but it's never going to be do it justice it never will so hmm. but it still would be a good thing to have even if you couldn't quite get all the colors but <laughs> um I think, so I think good. yeah that'd be kind of cool yeah so um I want to I do want to leave you also with the last words or if there's just anything else on your heart that you're thinking oh I wanted to share this one last thing or any message yeah um so the number one question that I get is, um, did it hurt when you passed away? And I think mm. people are so, cause the only thing that we can really understand is feeling in this realm. So if it hurts, why would I want to do that? And I can, I can honestly say that when, um, when I did pass away, I didn't feel pain as it was actively happening. And I didn't feel pain while it was up there. Um, and I am just so grateful that I have the opportunity to talk to people like yourself that are willing to spread the message of what's important and how to be a better person and to love each other a little bit better. So that's the one thing that I would really want people to take away from this video is not that I'm not a Christian or that I'm not like, <laughs> you know, all those, <laughs> yeah. Think, right. I would rather people say, oh my gosh, like what was important and what they wanted her to learn was that we need to love each other more and that we need to be kinder to each other as a whole, not just, not just in continents, but worldwide. We all, we're all interconnected. It doesn't matter the borders or the nationalities, like we have to love each other. And especially now more so than ever, like times are getting hard for a lot of people. And if we could yeah. just take one ounce of anger and turn it into an ounce of happiness or kindness, it would change the world if everyone did that. Mm. So the ripple effects, <laughs> the ripple effects. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Rachel, for oh, God, sharing you. your amazing experience with us. And thank you to everyone watching. This has been Julie McVeigh with Unordinary Made Ordinary. And I hope you'll join us next time for another fascinating interview. Um, if you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this type of content, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you'll be alerted to future uh, videos. I hope you're all having just a wonderful day or evening wherever you are on the planet or off the planet. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. <laughs>